Hello everybody, I'm Dana Sparks. I am the director of the Georgia Real Estate Academy and this course is the 2017 GAR Contract Dissection. It is a great course number 67405 offered through the Georgia Real Estate Academy Greg School 6915. This course is the GAR contract dissection for 2017, which does include the mid-year revisions as of May 2017. And it is sponsored by Maximum One, and I am the instructor. So before we get started, everybody please print out your handout so that you can follow along. Uh, I'm gonna go through the handout as we go through the course. This course is for three hours of CE or just for your own information. Please feel free to take notes on the handouts and here we go. Thank y'all so much for attending. And again, 2017 GAR Contract Dissection. Now GAR does stand for the Georgia Association of Realtors and this is the contract that is licensed by the Georgia Association of Realtors. You are authorized to use this contract by virtue of one of three things. Either number one, if you are a member of GAR, which you are a member of GAR, if you are a member of a local board of realtors, then part of your dues goes to the state level, which is GAR, and part of your dues goes to the national level, which is NAR, or the National Association of Realtors. So if you do belong to a local board, then part of your dues goes to GAR and NAR. You will get an NRDS number, and that is the number that you use to access the GAR contracts on, uh, typically on the MLS service, wherever you use to access them. The other way you can be an authorized user is if you do not belong to GAR, you can pay GAR a fee, they charge an annual fee to be a, for their licensing agreement to be an authorized user, and you take care of that through the Georgia Association of Realtors website. And the third way to be an authorized user of the GAR contracts is if you are a co-op agent in a transaction and the other agent is an authorized user. So in other words, if, if your co-op agent is an authorized user and you are on the signature page as the agent representing one of the parties, then you may also use these contracts. So the first thing we are going to get started with is to go over what GAR did this year for 2017, including, as I said, the, the mid-year review. So basically every January, GAR puts out a new contract form. They revise their contract form from the previous year, and then approximately May of every year, they go back and do some revisions. Now typically those revisions have to do with typographical or grammatical errors or changes or corrections. Um, sometimes they will make substantial content corrections, and we're gonna cover all of those in this class. So in 2017, this was basically the first major overhaul of the purchase and sale agreement in 10 years. Now, if you have been a user of the GAR contracts, you'll recognize that there have been some substantial formatted, formatting changes throughout the years, but this is the major overhaul of the content. Uh, they have changed, GAR has changed things here and there throughout some of the sections, and again, major formatting changes by putting all the fill in the blanks to the front page. But this is the first time they actually took the purchase and sale itself and went through everything uh, and made some changes to make it more understandable to agents as well as to our clients. Uh, they revised language to protect brokers and agents and to clarify concepts. Their intent, GAR's intent in general, is to keep the transactions together. Very few new forms this year, uh, and as always, universal changes apply across forms. All signature pages have been modified to include check boxes for an additional signature page, which is a new form this year. There are more spaces between the lines and more fill-ins. In general, do not leave any fill in the blanks and do not use TBD for to be determined. Uh, if you put to be determined, it truly does not reflect a meeting of the minds, which is required for enforceability. Now, if this is your first contracts class and you 
uh, in about a year, you weren't aware of the mid-year changes in 2016. They uh, just did a couple of things. They changed the title insurance to quote that the quote that uh, parties are getting is the enhanced policy. And that is based on the TRID laws, uh, which stands for the Truth in Lending RESPA Integrated Disclosures. That is now the law of the land since 2015 per the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. If you're not familiar with that, uh, definitely get with your lender, your broker, and your closing attorney to uh, find out what those laws are and how those affect you. Um, uh, there was a mistake where it had uh, the if there was a two th if there was a W nine uh, if the earnest money if the holder dispersed earnest money to a seller they would require them to sign a uh, W nine that was just a mistake and it really required a ten ninety nine and then on the signature page they added the broker's address and the reason they did that is because. That is required for the TRID laws, number one, and also because many agents are not going to closings anymore, and the closing attorney needs to know where to send the checks and the closing disclosure to. Um, also, mid-year last year, they added a section of termites, dry rot, pests, wood-destroying organisms, and they uh, added some labels. Basically, if you're not familiar with doing something other than purchase and sale, if you're doing a lease purchase, or for example, if you're selling a condominium, you use, GAR used to have specific forms for those particular types of purchases. Now, basically, what you do is you're gonna use the, um, the regular purchase and sale agreement, and then you're gonna use another form to make it more specific to what you are doing. So for example, if you are doing a uh, lease purchase, then you use the regular purchase and sale agreement, and then you're gonna use the lease purchase exhibit. Uh, and they have a lease purchase exhibit, and it says specifically to be used for that particular situation. Same thing, if you are selling a condominium and uh, there used to be a specific purchase and sale agreement for a condo, but now all you do is use the regular purchase and sale agreement and then there is an exhibit to tie it into the fact that you are selling a condominium as opposed to a fee simple property because there are different things that the consumers need to know and you need to contract for. Um, and then some other changes, but uh, you can read through this handout to look at the other changes. Um, for That was for the 2016 mid-year review. For the 2017 mid-year contract revisions, they did a couple of major things, and I'll go over those more specifically and more in depth as we get to those sections in the contract. But basically, there is a cash exhibit. There's always been a cash exhibit, but they changed the title to say no financing contingency. Because what is happening is uh, right now, we are in the spring, summer of 2017, and we are in a very aggressive market, a seller's market, so to speak, a very fast market right now. And so basically, what is happening is there are a lot of sellers that are uh, getting multiple offers and so what some buyers are doing is some buyers are making their offers not contingent upon them getting financing so they are actually still getting a loan to purchase the house but they know they are not going to have any problem getting the loan and they're not making their deal contingent upon that financing. But as you and I know, there are lenders involved with financing and issues that come up with the loans. So basically, they changed the title of the cash exhibit because the buyer isn't, now there are still some cash buyers, but the buyers, there are some buyers that are, they're not making their deal contingent upon they're getting the financing, uh, but they are getting financing, and that would be the exhibit to use. In that cash exhibit, they did address the right to unilaterally extend the closing date. And again, I'll get to that more in depth when we get to that exhibit. 
Um, in the community association exhibit for the mid mid year of 2017 review, they completely changed the title to say payment of community association fees and disclosure, and they address the transfer and initiation fees. Um, Basically, what's happening with our HOAs is the HOA, the homeowners associations, are charging fees in and of themselves, but then there are management companies. These HOAs have these management companies that charge all types of fees. They charge internet access fees, uh, transfer fees, account and good standing fees, uh, all kinds of fees like that. And some of these fees are timed, like you could pay for a letter in good standing, but it is only useful, it's only um, valid for a certain number of days. And if your closing gets delayed, uh, the closing attorney will need a new uh, HOA letter for statement being in good standing for the seller, and the management company charges for that. So uh, this revision to the community association disclosure is an attempt to really determine what all the fees are going to be at closing so that there are no surprises at closing. Um, and then there were some other title changes and typographical grammatical changes again that occurred in May of 2017. Um, here is where we talked about who is authorized to use the GAR contract forms and uh, where you can access are and NAR is where you can find out your NRDS number if you have forgotten it. Now in 2017 there were only three new forms. They did include an additional signature page for buyers and sellers, an additional signature page for tenants and landlords, as well as an agreement for the escrow agent to serve as the holder of the earnest money. So for prior to 2017 there were only a place to sign for two buyers and two sellers. Yet there are many contracts where there are more than two buyers and more than two sellers. So they have wisely added additional signature page and now all those signatures are numbered one, two, one, uh, one, two, and then the additional signature page. It continues on for the buyers and the sellers with three, four, five, and six. Um, this other part of the first part of your handout does have uh, an outline form of what we are going to cover as we go through the contract. Uh, we're going to talk about the fact that GAR removed the survey paragraph um, and all the page numbers moved up and uh, they did talk about possession of property shall be transferred to the buyer. Uh, they also included a reminder to use the temporary occupancy agreement in the possession section of the contract and they further delineated uh, material relationship. They talked about closing costs and prorations, uh, closing and possession, inspection and due diligence. Um, and again, I'm going to cover these issues as we go through the contract. But I want to let you know that in your handout, again, please print out your handout and keep it with you. It does have a lot of information that I am going to cover uh, in this lecture, that uh, in this class, that you can read and print out for yourself. So let's go ahead and get to, uh, Gar also made the changes to some other forms, the counter offer, which I am going to go over, seller's property disclosure statement, I will address that as well. Community association disclosure, uh, amendment to address concerns with the property, amendment to the sales price, due diligence. Uh, I am going to cover these as well. Um, just a reminder for the consumer brochures, the guard removed all the cover pages and they removed all the paragraph numbers. These are a list of all the GAR consumer brochures. Please make sure to use them you need to protect yourself as the agent and utilize any and all consumer brochures as they are applicable to your transaction. And you want to make sure that your consumer gets these in their hands and you want to be able to demonstrate that you did send these to your consumer. There are all types of consumer brochures for all sorts of situations. How to protect yourself when selling a house. How to protect yourself when buying a home. 
buying a home to be constructed, that would be for new construction, obviously, buying in a condominium, what to know if there's an HOA or condominium association, what sellers should know about short sales and distressed properties, what buyers should know about flood hazard areas and flood insurance, what new landlords need to know about leasing property, the ABCs of agency, everybody should have that, a mold pamphlet, and a lead-based paint pamphlet. Just as a reminder, if the house was built prior to 1978, you absolutely are required to use the lead-based paint disclosure form, as well as make sure your customers and clients get a copy of the lead-based paint pamphlet. Now, just as a point of practice, if you are showing the house or you are listing the house and there is anything in that house that looks like it could have been built or painted prior to 1978, go ahead and use the lead-based paint disclosure anyway. So even if, for example, the structure itself was built after that time frame, if there is, for example, an antique mantle place, a mantelpiece in the property, antique implies that it was built and constructed and probably finished and painted prior to 1978. I highly encourage you to go ahead and use the lead-based paint uh, uh, disclosure and pamphlet regardless. All right, I'm not gonna cover leases and rentals, but if you do those, absolutely take a look at, they drastically change the rental application and the pet exhibit to make sure to address the issue of service animals and comfort animals. So if you um, do leases and rentals, um, make sure you are well versed on that, well experienced and trained on that, and take a look at those changes. And um, in general, just wanted to bring to your attention that GAR does have many useful forms that a lot of agents are not familiar with. And at the end of your handout, you will see I do have a list of all of uh, a, a table of contents, in essence, of the GAR contract forms and all of the forms that are in there. But this reminder of important dates is a fabulous form to use, not only for yourself and your clients, but to share with your co-op agent as well. There is a broker transaction checklist and review that is designed to help brokers, but it is also a great form for you to use every time you get a property under contract, whether you're representing a buyer or a seller all the consumer brochures, the commission agreement, especially you buyer's agents, you need to make sure that you have in writing an agreement regarding the commission that your broker is going to get paid. The seller contracts for commission with the listing broker in the listing agreement, and then the listing broker is who pays the selling broker, and that is handled, uh, number one, there is a, uh, contract, so to speak, according to Seth Weissman, through the offer of a co-op fee in the MLS system. But to have it in writing, you absolutely must have the co-op commission agreement signed. And you buyer's agents, you should send that over when you send the offer. Now, the buyer and the seller don't sign that because the seller doesn't pay the selling commission. The listing broker pays the selling broker the commission. And then of course, agents, you guys get paid your commission by virtue of your independent contract agreement with your broker. Um, GAR also has an estimate net to seller, an estimate cost to buyer, request for loan information. Now this is, if you are representing a seller, this is to help your seller send this off to their existing uh, mortgage lender. It's uh, to help them get a payoff. Notice of uh, notice to terminate a brokerage engagement, broker's information disclosure. This form is great to use if, for example, you as the agent or the broker are asked something regarding the property or, um, or something regarding your clients or some information that uh, you have agreed to share. A lot of times agents handle this with emails, but you really should use this formal form that's broker's information disclosure. Take a look at that. There is also a mutual agreement to terminate a purchase and sale agreement and disbursement of earnest money. If there is a contract that fails to close and uh, it is a little difficult to determine 
which party defaulted or if there is a little bit of issues going on on both sides, then this is a great form to use rather than the unilateral notice to terminate and agreement to disperse trust funds, which we will talk about later in this class. This is a form to use where both parties agree to terminate their rights to the contract, to the properties, and they agree to not sue each other and they agree uh, to not sue the brokers. There is a place in this agreement also to go through all the financial compensation for each party and for the brokers. So take a look at that. There is a mutual termination of a brokerage engagement agreement. So this, uh, uh, this is a unilateral termination of a brokerage engagement. This is mutual. This is if you are firing your seller or your buyer, or if your buyer or your seller are firing you. Those would be the forms you use. Vendor list. You guys, this is a great list to use. You know that for any vendor that you recommend to your clients, you should give more than one name. And this is a fabulous list where you can keep a record of the names and the contact information of the vendors that you do recommend uh, to your clients to check out for their services that they need so that they have a, a choice and they are the ones that are choosing the uh, vendor to use. There is a broker to broker referral agreement, which y'all are all used to using that. However, license law says that the party, the, the public person that is being referred, they too must give their consent in writing to that referral. In essence, you need to make sure that your public person is aware, your public person must agree that it's okay for you to make money off of sharing their name and number with another agent. So you must use, if you are ever sending a broker to broker referral agreement, you must also get that party's consent in writing and this referral authorization form is a fabulous form to use for that. And if you are ever switching companies and you are leaving pending transactions at one company, uh, that have not closed yet before you transfer to your new company, both you and your former broker and your new broker are going to want to sign this agreement between the new broker and former broker of the transferring licensee in order for you to stay in compliance with license law. General contract reminders. A legal description is required. A property address in and of itself is absolutely not a sufficient legal description. Just think about it. How many peach tree roads are there in Atlanta? Yep, you got it, more than one. Therefore, how many one, two, three peach tree roads are there in Atlanta? Yes, more than one. Your closing attorneys will tell you that the legal description is one of the most important elements for your contract. You need to use an adequate legal description on your contract so that the closing attorney when preparing the deeds can specifically prepare the warranty deed to transfer that identifies this specific parcel of property as being transferred versus another parcel of property. Parties must get a copy of everything they sign that is repeated in license law, in various aspects of license law. Um, make sure your closing attorneys and your lenders get copies of all exhibits and amendments, especially as you are going through a contract and the buyer and the seller agree to change any of the terms uh, if they agree to change closing dates, possession dates, um, money to vendors in lieu of other concessions. Your closing attorneys and your lenders absolutely must get copies of all these exhibits and amendments because if they don't, there could be a major change that would cause a delay in closing um, that may or may not be agreed to at the time by the parties and may not be allowed for in the unilateral extension. So just make sure all parties get copies of everything as the buyer and the seller change the contract with exhibits and amendments. Do not leave any blanks. If there is a blank and it does not pertain to your parties, you're going to put an NA, which means not applicable, or if it is a fill in the blank and it has a dollar sign before it, you're not going to put in NA, you're going to put zero so that you can demonstrate the buyer and the seller did see this provision in the contract and they negotiated the dollar amount to zero dollars. Do not hold earnest money. 
you license law says you need to turn in earnest money to the broker as soon as practically possible. Never be in possession of earnest money um, for a length of time. For example, if you have a buyer and you get earnest money and they have not purchased a contract yet, uh, you need to go ahead and turn that broke that earnest money into the broker. Complete the brokerage address on the signature page. Again, that is for the trid laws, as well as so the closing attorneys will have the correct broker to send anything should they need to send checks or the closing disclosure to the broker. Complete your license number and your firm license number on all contracts. That again is uh, per license law. Uh, you need to follow up on the earnest money deposit. So for example, if you are working with a buyer, or for that matter, even if you are a listing agent, and the buyer is to remit money within a certain number of days, it is your responsibility as the agents to follow up with the holder of those funds to make sure they were received and deposited. Go ahead and request proof of deposit. Um, make sure you complete agency and uh, uh, you know, on the contract, make sure you represent the type of agency relationship or customer relationship that your firm has with the public and make sure you include contact information for customers. Limit your special stipu stipulations. Do not write special stipulations on your own. Make sure that if you have a special stipulation you need to write, number one, first of all, take a look at the contract. If there is an issue that is already addressed in the contract, uh, or in an exhibit, for example, uh, appraisal contingencies or something along those lines. Do not add a special stipulation that addresses that same concept because your special stipulation will take precedence over the contract or the exhibit. And typically, you do not write it with the intent that you have in mind. You do not write it to protect your client, and you do not write the consequences for failure to perform. But if there is a situation where you do need to uh, write a special stipulation before you write anything on your own please make sure and look through the extensive library of special stipulations already printed by GAR and I do have a, a, a copy of those not the special stipulations in and of themselves but an index of all the special stipulations in your handout as well as some attorney written special stipulations uh, that we like to share with you guys as agents that will help. And again, all buyer and all seller signatures are required. So in other words, if you have uh, two or more buyers, you need all of their signatures on all of the forms. There is a GAR legal helpline, and if you go to GAR's website, which is garealtor.com, under the Law Ethics tab, you will see a uh, place for a legal helpline. You click on that, and you can type in your question, and you will get an answer. Um, again, confirm all your contract questions with your broker. Uh, please attend additional classes that we offer through this um, uh, school, the Georgia Real Estate Academy. You can see all those classes by going to this website and clicking on calendar. Um, these classes are hosted by Maximum on Realtors. Credits, your CE credits will be recorded within three business days. And y'all have fun out there uh, helping buyers and sellers with their real estate needs. Um, there are, I do have videos of ongoing contract tips. Uh, if you go to YouTube and look for the channel Real Estate Made Crystal Clear, I have approximately three years or so of video tips of contract tips that cover not only the GAR contracts, but the RE Forms contracts, as well as other issues in and of themselves. So, all right, here we go. We are going to start with the GAR contract in and of itself, and slide this over. This is the GAR Purchase and Sale Agreement. It is Form F20, and you will see every year, GAR puts the year that they put the printing. So this is the 2017 printing. And, um, Part of GAR's licensing agreement is after they come out with the New Year's contract. So after the 2017 uh, contract is made available, then at that point, you are not to use it as a licensing violation of the Georgia Association of Realtors to use any of the GAR forms that were printed 
prior to 2017. You cannot use older um, disclosure forms, contracts, exhibits, amendments, things like that. That is a violation of the GAR licensing agreement and GAR can pull your right to use these GAR contracts and they can pull your broker's right to use these GAR contracts if you are found in violation of that licensing agreement. Now, uh, basically we're gonna fill out the purchase, this is the purchase and sale agreement. It says the buyer agrees to buy and the seller agrees to sell. The property identification, you put the address here, but again, that is not the legal description, but you put in the address you're gonna put in an MLS number that helps to identify the property, especially for your brokers. And if you buyer's agents forget to use the uh, commission instructions, then you can go back to the MLS listing and look and see what the co-op fee is that is offered. But again, there can be typographical errors in FMLS and Georgia MLS or whatever MLS system you're using, so make sure to use that commission instructions. But again, this is just an identifier, and then you wanna put in the tax ID number. Now here's a place to fill in the legal description, and you are either going to attach it as an exhibit, and a fabulous exhibit to attach would be a copy of the seller's actual warranty deed, um, or you're gonna describe the property in the deed book and page, and this is the warranty deed book and page. This is not the plat book. The plat book is not a legal description. The plat book and page is just a, uh, basically a graph of the lot in and of itself, but what you want is a deed book so that your closing attorney or anybody can go to the county records and look up the warranty deed book and the page number and get the warranty deed of that property. Now, the third section for legal description would be to complete land lot, district, section, lot, block, unit, phase, section of whatever subdivision, and this is where you put the plat book and page. This is the, um, this legal description is a good legal, legal description if you fill in all this information. A lot of times, though, agents will only fill in land lot, um, sometimes and lot, sometimes they'll leave the block blank or the district or the section blank, and so it's not totally a full, accurate legal description. So a copy of the warranty deed would be the best, or the warranty deed book and page would be second best. Then you're going to fill in the purchase price of the property and the closing costs that the seller is contributing towards the buyer's closing costs. Then you are going to fill in the closing date and the possession date. Now let me talk a little bit about closing date. In this contract, it has a specific date. So it has a date that the parties agree they are going to close this transaction. If the parties close, if something happens after you are binding and the parties are going to close on a date that is sooner than this date or later than this date, you will need an amendment between the buyer and the seller agreeing on a different date. So the reason you, do, you need that is because you need to demonstrate the meeting of the minds between the buyer and the seller to uh, agree that they both agreed upon closing on a different date other than what they had agreed upon in the actual purchase and sale agreement. Now, possession. Um, GAR this year added two checkboxes. They made this a little bit easier to read. So either possession is occurring at the closing, which is ideal in every situation, or if the possession is going to occur X number of days after closing at such and such time. Um, now GAR has put in here a reminder for you as the agents to discuss, uh, to attach the temporary occupancy agreement. Basically, at closing, as soon as the buyer and the seller sign the uh, deeds and they transfer, the deed comes out of the seller's name, goes into the buyer's name, at that point, the seller no longer owns the property. So if the seller is maintaining possession, even for a few days after closing, they are... Um, they are in someone else's house. 
and they are taking temporary occupancy of that house. So you absolutely need to have a discussion of what that means. And the reason I'm talking about this is after your seller closes on the property, they no longer have hazard insurance on that property. The hazard insurance is now um, covered by the new buyer. Um, so they don't have insurance on the property and they typically do not have insurance on their contents, on their personal possessions. So if a seller is going to stay in a property after closing, you need to have a discussion with them that they need to have a discussion with their insurance company to determine how their possessions are going to be protected while they are uh, occupying someone else's home and during the move while they are being moved. Um, also, what happens if those sellers never get out of the property? It is now the buyer's property, yet there is someone living in their home. That's an issue that needs to be addressed. Um, the, uh, another couple of other issues along with that is at closing, a buyer, uh, uh, owner-occupant buyer, signs paperwork at the closing table that clearly states they have an intent to occupy that property within 60 days. So if they, that could be an issue if you have a seller that stays in the property, never vacates the property, at least for 60 days, that could put the buyer in a, um, tenuous position with the paperwork they had signed at closing. Um, a couple of other issues is what happens if the seller stays in the buyer's property after closing and when they move out there are there is damage that happens. Well who pays for that damage? That is a huge issue that definitely needs to be addressed and I do I will cover towards the end of class some special stipulations that will address that issue. Um, but you want to take care of that. Also, you don't necessarily want to create a lease. You do not necessarily want to create a landlord tenant relationship between the new buyer and the seller uh, because then you invoke the Georgia landlord tenant laws, which are a whole different set of laws. So the temporary occupancy agreement is the form uh, to use to still outline the rights, responsibilities, and consequences uh, of the buyer and the seller without invoking the Georgia landlord tenant laws. So take a look at that. You definitely, ideally, you want a vacant property at closing. You want the seller to have already moved out so that the buyer can move in so that none of those potential issues become an issue. Um, holder of earnest money. I'm going to talk about that in just a minute uh, when we actually get to the next page. But in here, you're going to write out with, who will be the holder of the earnest money. Ideally, you are going to have either the buyer's broker or the listing broker named as the holder of the earnest money. Um, sometimes the buyer and the seller will ask for the attorney to hold the earnest money. There is a brand new form that you absolutely should use if you are going to have the attorney hold the earnest money. And I will get into a discussion of that later. And then you are going to identify the closing attorney or the law firm. And again, in Georgia, it must be a law firm licensed to do uh, closings in the state of Georgia in order for uh, it to be a legal closing in the state of Georgia. Then for earnest money, you're going to put the box, check the box if the earnest money is paid by check cash or wire transfer, and then you have three options. The first option is you have the amount of the earnest money, and it says amount of earnest money as of offer date. The only way you check that box is if you as the agent, you are in possession of those funds at the time you are writing the offer. If you are actually in possession of those funds, or the holder is in possession of those funds, as of the offer date, that's the only way you should uh, uh, check this box for option A. If the buyer is going to remit those funds a certain number of days after the buyer and the seller go binding, then you check that box. You still fill in the dollar amount and you put in the number of days from the binding agreement date when the buyer is to uh, remit those funds to the holder. And then C is just a blank where you would put in some other situation. Um, 
we used to see that filled in uh, pertaining to short sales, but we do not really see that filled in that much anymore. Again, I will get into a more lengthy discussion of earnest money when we get to the, the legalese and the rights and the responsibilities and the consequences of that, which are contained in the next paragraph. Then we have the section on due diligence and inspection. Due diligence period. The property is being sold subject to a due diligence period of X number of days from the binding agreement date. So typically we see anywhere from seven to 14, 15 days um, that the property is sold subject to due diligence. Then you have option payment for due diligence. In consideration of the seller granting the buyer the option to terminate this agreement, the buyer, number one, has paid the seller $10 non-refundable option money, the receipt and sufficiency of which is hereby acknowledged. That $10 never changes hands. That's why it says receipt and sufficiency of which is hereby acknowledged. But basically what the due diligence is, is the seller grants the buyer the option of terminating the contract. The buyer has X number of days, whatever you negotiate in here, um, so if you're representing the buyer, you want that to be a longer number of days. And if you're representing the seller, you typically want that to be a shorter number of days. But basically this says for this time frame, the seller says, okay, buyer, you get a quote unquote free look. You have the right to terminate the contract within that time frame for any or no reason. You don't have to tell me the reason, but you can uh, terminate the contract within that time frame. So basically, you are creating a mini option contract within the broader context of the entire purchase and sale agreement, and therefore you have separate consideration of this $10 that is paid for that. Then we have the second option, which I don't think I have ever seen in a contract, where the buyer pays the seller directly additional option money and it is non-refundable. Um, Lead-based paint, I already discussed that. Uh, to the best of the seller's knowledge, the residential dwelling was or any portion painted or fixture painted therein was or was not prior to 78. So again, prior to 1978, this is absolutely required. And then you have the brokerage relationship. Selling broker, that's the broker working with the buyer, is either working with the buyer as a client and that would mean that you have a buyer brokerage agreement signed. That's the document that creates the client relationship. Or you, this broker, so this would be the company name. The selling broker is working with the buyer as a customer. Now, license law says if you are working with the public in a client relationship, you absolutely are required by license law to have that, those, client, those agency documents signed. That creates the client relationship. There is no license law that says you have to have any, any paperwork signed to represent that you are working with the public person as a customer. However, instructor to student, um, and please check with your own broker, your firm may have a policy on this, but regardless of your firm's policy, instructor to student, I highly, highly encourage you to get these customer documents signed if you are working with the public. Definitely, whatever capacity that your firm is working with the public, you wanna get that clearly understood in writing. Again, the client relationship is delineated in the buyer brokerage agreement. There is a customer acknowledgement form that GAR has that you definitely want to get your buyer to sign, as well as using those consumer brochures I mentioned earlier. That way, it is in writing and there's no ambiguity regarding the uh, uh, information that you can provide to the public because it varies if you're working with your public as a client or as a customer. Um, dual, and then you also would mark if you're acting as a dual agent or a designated agent. So dual agency is one broker, one agent working with the buyer as a client and the seller as a client. One broker, one agent, two client relationships, that is dual. Uh, nothing illegal about dual, but you must have written consent from both the buyer and the seller and make sure your broker allows it within their company's policies. Designated agency, one broker, two agents, each agent 
has a client relationship with their respective public person. So one broker, one agent working with the seller as a client, one agent working with the buyer as a client. That would be designated agency. Easy way to think about it, the broker has designated agent A to work with the seller client and agent B to work with the buyer client. And then here you fill in the name of the agent that is working with the buyer. Um, on the listing side, again, you're going to put in the brokerage name, the firm, the company name. If you're working with the seller as a client, that means you will have the listing agreement signed. If you are working with the seller as a customer, and that could be, for example, a for sale by owner or a neighbor or somebody who is selling their house, but you are not it is not actually listed and you're not working with them as a client. Now the form, again, no license law requiring this signed, but you should protect yourself and make it clear to the public seller the relationship that you and your company have with that person. So the form that, that outlines this customer relationship is called the authorization to show unlisted property. Um, this also has a place in this form where you write out the commission. If the seller is paying the commission, it has a place on that form. If license law does say, if you do not have this customer agreement signed, uh, you need to have it in writing which public party is paying the brokerage's commissions. So this form, the authorization to show unlisted property, is a fabulous form to use because it already has a place for that. Um, if not, you will have to include it in the contract. And then dual agency and designated agency. Again, dual agency, one broker, one agent, working with both the seller as a client and the buyer as a client, and designated one broker, two agents, working with the public both as client relationships. And then material relationship disclosure. Material relationship required to be disclosed by the broker is as follows. Now again, you know, and I had it further in my notes at the beginning, what a material relationship is. A material relationship is if you as the agent or your broker has a relationship with the buyer or the seller where it is a little bit where you would exercise um, you're obviously going to be open, honest, and fair with all parties, all members of the public, um, and all parties. But if you have an outside relationship where it could be easily understood that you would exercise a little bit more due care, um, then that would be material relationship. For example, material relationship would be if you are related to the buyer or the seller. If you have a, uh, business relationship with the buyer or the seller, either ongoing or past. Um, another material relationship that is often overlooked is if your buyer or your seller is a past client, then you do have a past business relationship with that public, and that really should be disclosed as a material relationship. Um, time limit of the author offer. This means that the offer, these terms as presented to, <clears throat> from the buyer to the seller are open for acceptance through that time frame, that time and date. I'll discuss this a little more at the end where it's explained in the rest of the contract. And then this paragraph here, consent to share non-public information, this is in our contracts based on the TRID laws from the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, where basically a lender and a closing attorney are only allowed to share non-public information with that client. For example, the, the lender, according to these trade laws, may only share the closing disclosure with the buyer, not with the other uh, parties of the contract, including the agents. So this form in here says that the buyer and the seller hereby consent that the closing attorney preparing and distributing an ALTA estimated statement of combined buyer and seller, that's the closing disclosure, it can share that with the seller, the brokers, and the brokers affiliated licensees working with this agreement. 
So even though that, that contract, that paragraph is there, that is the buyer and the seller giving consent that they consent that the lender and the attorney can share that information with the parties. Even though they consent to that, some closing attorneys and some lenders still will not share that and you need to get uh, the closing disclosure, for example, a copy of that from the actual buyer. And then it has a place for the buyer and the seller to initial. And then here is where your name will go in as the authorized user of the GAR contracts. All right, so that is basically the fill in the blanks of the GAR purchase and sale agreement. Now the rest of the contract explains what happens. What does all that mean legally? What are the responsibilities of the buyer, the responsibilities of the seller, the consequences for the buyer and the seller complying with what they said they will do, and the consequences for the buyer and the seller if they fail to do what they have said they are going to do. So let's continue on. You will see that these fill in the blank, this is paragraph A, key terms and conditions, and then it is numbered. And then we get to paragraph B, corresponding paragraphs for A, and the numbers are the same, and it explains the legalese, so to speak. So for example, here in paragraph a1, you fill in the purchase and sale, uh, uh, what all that means in the property and so forth and so on. And then in paragraph B, we describe what that is, what the title is and all of that. So here we go. Basically for the purchase and sale, the uh, seller agrees that at time of closing, the seller will convey good and marketable title by limited warranty deed. Basically, the seller has to be able to convey title, so it has to be unencumbered with no liens, and um, it has to be good and marketable. Now, good and marketable doesn't mean insurable. Good and marketable is uh, uh, defined here, and it basically means that Sorry about that. Here we go. Well, can't find it. It basically means that the um, the title insurance for that title, there's no increase in premium. Um, and the deed is subject only to zoning, general utility sewer drainage easements, and uh, that as long as the improvements don't encroach, and declarations of a condo association or an HOA association as recorded as of the binding agreement date and any other leases or other encumbrances specified in this agreement. Buyer agrees to assume seller's responsibilities in any leases. Um, examination. So basically, one other thing. If a buyer is buying a property and they want it, they want to live in that property, they're buying it owner-occupied. If there is a current tenant in that property, you need to, the buyer needs to address the fact that there is a tenant and there is an existing lease in that property um, because a buyer buys that property subject to that lease. So if I'm a buyer, I want to see a copy of the lease. Um, if the buyer has, what happens if the buyer doesn't vacate before closing? What happens if uh, there's damage if the buyer doesn't vacate prior to closing and there's damage? Where, what happens to the security deposit? whole nother can of worms. Um, I have done a separate video on that, so take a look at that in that um, site I mentioned at the beginning of the class. Um, examination, buyer may examine title and obtain a survey of the property. Again, they took out the, the survey paragraph in paragraph two, but this is saying, hey buyer, go ahead and get a survey of the property. And if you have any objections to the title at or prior to closing, uh, basically, the buyer may examine the title and furnish the seller with a written statement of title objections. If the seller fails or is unable to satisfy valid title objections at or prior to closing or any unilateral extension of that would prevent the seller from conveying good and marketable title, then the buyer may terminate without penalty as long as you do it with written notice to the seller. Okay, here we go. Here's good and marketable. Good and marketable is defined as a uh, uh, title insurance, 
with regular rates subject only to standard exceptions. So a uh, good and marketable title doesn't mean insurable. It has to do with the premium price of the policy. And then this section here was added this year uh, to reflect the TRID laws that basically the quote of title insurance does have to include the enhanced title insurance policy. Purchase price, purchase price US dollars paid for by wire transfer of immediately available funds to the closing attorney. All right, closing costs. Basically, the closing costs paid by the buyer. At closing, the buyer is responsible for the transfer tax, cost to search the title and tax records, and to prepare the limited warranty deed, and then any and other, all other costs and fees associated to close the transaction, unless it's provided for herein, which would be either the closing cost contribution by the seller, or if the buyer is getting an FHA or VA insured loan, there are some other seller required fees, and we'll get to those when we get to the loan exhibits. Items paid by the seller. At closing, the seller is responsible for any contribution they agreed to pay to the buyer's closing costs. Um, and uh, basically this says, uh, the buyer acknowledges that the buyer's mortgage lender may not allow the seller's contribution or any full amount to be used for some costs or expenses. If such event, so basically the lender has the final say on what the contributions to the buyer's fees may be. And if the seller on the first part has agreed to co contribute X amount of dollars to the buyer towards their closing costs, if the lender does not allow them, any unused portion of that seller's stated contribution does go back to the seller. Um, seller shall pay all fees and costs to the closing attorney to prepare or record their title or cure their title. So if there are any liens or defaults on their title, the seller has to pay the closing attorney to fix that in order for them to convey the property. And uh, if the seller is not attending the closing in person. So if there are any power of attorney documents that need to be completed or uh, mailing or courier doc, uh, fees, the seller agrees to pay for that. And then prorations. Basically, um, if the property is being closed before the tax bill is out for the year, then the closing attorney uses the previous year's tax bill to estimate the property taxes. And for the ad valorem property taxes, fees, so forth and so on, basically the buyer and the seller agree to prorate these costs when, if they, if they close on the property before those actual numbers are out. Um, if there is a tax appeal, if the seller has appealed their property taxes to the county, then basically if that, once that appeal is uh, settled, then the, uh, the, the buyer gets the benefit of that tax appeal for the year in which the property is sold. But if the seller had appealed property taxes for years prior to the year the property is actually being conveyed, then the seller gets to maintain the, the differences if they won an appeal. Closing in possession. The right to extend the closing. Buyer or seller may unilaterally extend the closing date for eight days upon notice to the other party given prior to or on the date of closing. So this date of closing that we put in here, either buyer or seller may extend it from eight days from that date, but they have to give notice prior to or on that date. And, but you can't just unilaterally extend it for any reason. There are only very, very limited uh, issues or reasons that either the buyer or the seller may extend the closing. So you can extend the closing unilaterally. Now, in a buyer or seller may always extend the closing by an amendment. If both parties agree, you can extend the closing for any number of days and any number of times. But unilaterally means you only need one party's signature. So one party is going to extend it the other party is being held into the, in the contract against their will. And I say against their will because if they agreed to it, then the parties would have extended with a signed amendment. So for eight days, basically you can only do it if the seller cannot satisfy valid title objections as long as those title objections aren't liens that can be satisfied with money or bonding off 
and as long as those title objections don't prevent the seller from conveying good and marketable title. Number two, the buyer's mortgage lender, I'm gonna skip this part in parentheses for a second, but uh, either buyer or seller may extend it unilaterally if the buyer's mortgage lender or the closing attorney is delayed and cannot fulfill their respective obligations by the date of closing, provided that delay is not caused by the buyer. Or three, the buyer has not received the required estimates or disclosures and buyer is prohibited from closing under federal regulations. Those are the trade laws I keep referring to. So basically, the lender has to give the buyer a, uh, a listing, uh, a final disclosure of what their fees are. Now, it gets a little confusing because those fees aren't necessarily the final fees, but those are the fees that the lender charges. The lender has to give that to the buyer at least three days prior to closing, or the lender is prohibited by the trade laws from closing. So that's what that has to do with. The second part is if the mortgage lender or the closing attorney is delayed. So for example, if the closing attorney um, has not completed the title search yet or the closing attorney cannot fit the closing into their schedule, then either party may unilaterally extend the contract. Now let me um, go back and read this part. Buyer's mortgage lender, even in an all cash transaction where the buyer is obtaining a mortgage loan. I addressed that a little bit in the all cash exhibit. Basically what that means is if a buyer is purchasing a property, they're still getting a loan, but they are not making the contract contingent upon that lender giving them financing. So for example, if a buyer is uh, totally sure that they are going to get their loan, they are not concerned about the financing whatsoever, so they're not making the deal contingent upon that, um, so they're not going to use a financing contingency exhibit. Uh, they would use the all cash exhibit, even though it's not all cash, or they would use no exhibit. But in this situation, they're still getting a loan, and if a mortgage lender still has delays, if, if the loan in and of itself is tied up in underwriting, um, whether it be contingent upon financing or not contingent upon financing, or the lender is not able to send out those, those financial disclosures three days prior to closing, then either party may use the unilateral extension for eight days. Now, the other thing it says is the right to unilaterally extend is exercised once by either party, it shall hereafter terminate. So it can be used by either the buyer or the seller, and it doesn't specify the, the reason. So for example, if the buyer really wants the property and the buyer finds out there are title issues, the buyer may initiate the unilateral extension even if it is for a seller issue, a title issue. Um, and if the seller wants the buyer to stay in property and the seller finds out uh, that the lender hasn't, for example, sent out the tread disclosure, a seller may utilize the unilateral extension, even if it's for a loan issue. But once it is used, it can only be used one time per contract, and that's it. Um, now, one other comment, eight days. Let me, I have here, see paragraph C4I. Basically, paragraph C4I states, uh, let me see if I have it here. Here we go. Paragraph C4I states that extension of deadlines. No time deadline under this agreement shall be extended by virtue of it falling on a Saturday, Sunday, or federal holiday except for the date of closing. So if inadvertently you're writing the contract and you put the day of closing on a Saturday, it automatically rolls over to Monday. There's no extension that needs to be agreed upon between the buyer and the seller. It automatically rolls till the following business day. And if that Monday is a federal holiday, it would automatically roll over to Tuesday. So closing is the only date that can be extended without anything in writing because it's provided for here. If, for example, your due diligence time frame ends on a Saturday, then it ends on a Saturday. The reason I point this out when, when talking about the unilateral, eight-day unilateral extension is, let me go back up to this paragraph, eight days. So, 
I don't know if y'all can see this, but if your initial closing date is on a Friday, then eight days, let's go to July. No, eight days from Friday is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight days from Friday would be a Saturday. Can't close on Saturday. Next day is a Sunday. Can't close on a Sunday. So the next available closing date would be Monday. So in this example, from June 2nd, Friday, June 2nd, to Monday, June 12th, that is 10 days. And if Monday was a federal holiday, it would roll over to this day, which would be Tuesday the 13th. So if your initial closing date was on a Friday and uh, eight days, you, again, by, by virtue of paragraph C4I, the earliest you're going to close, the earliest the contract is going to be extended for is 10 days, and it's potentially 11 days. Now, 11 days is a long time to extend a contract especially when it was done unilaterally and one party is held into the contract against their will. Bottom line, do not schedule your closings for Fridays because if this unilateral extension is invoked, then you're going to run into that issue. If you guys are extending your, if the buyer and the seller extend their contract by an amendment, don't extend it through a Friday because you could still extend it for that. All right. Um, Keys and openers, basically at closing, the seller shall provide the buyer with all keys, openers, and so forth and so on. Um, holder of the earnest money. The earnest money shall be deposited into the holder's account with the holder being permitted to retain the interest. That, that's in there for license law. Um, the, so basically, on this, on the front page, this is where you fill in for the buyer to remit the earnest money. The earnest money shall be paid by the buyer at, you put in the dollar amount, X number of days from the binding agreement date. In here, we have where the, when the holder is to deposit the money. So once it's received, the holder should deposit not later than five banking days from the binding agreement date or when it's actually received based on what the buyer and the seller agreed to. If the buyer writes a check, the holder can basically hang on to that money and not have to act on that money until the check has cleared the account. Um, basically what that means, and different companies have different policies on that. Um, so if that's important, for example, if, uh, for example, many companies have a policy where they're gonna hold a personal check for 10 banking days. That's really important because the holder does not have to disperse those funds or act on those funds until that time frame. So if, for example, your buyer uh, writes a personal check for the earnest money, sends it to the holder, and let's say the holder has a policy to hold a personal check for 10 banking days. If the buyer, let's say the buyer terminates under due diligence on day five, well, let's say they find another house they want to buy. They cannot use that earnest money for house number two because it is still being held by the holder. And this says the holder does not have to act on it until it's cleared their, their account. And different companies have different firms on that. Furthermore, it says, um, in the event the earnest money check is dishonored by the bank or not timely paid. So <clears throat> let's say the holder, the, the buyer does send in earnest money and it bounces from the bank or it's not honored by the bank for whatever reason. There are many banks that will not honor uh, check numbers in the 100s or 200s. Um, or if the buyer never remitted the, the funds when they said they were going to. If that happens, the holder is responsible for giving notice to the buyer and the seller. Because basically, you guys, this purchase and sale agreement this is a receipt for the money. This says that the buyer has given however many thousands of dollars to the holder. The holder says, we've gotten it, unless the holder gives notice that we have not received it. So the holder, if they don't get it or it bounces by the bank, from the bank, then the holder says, hey, buyer and seller, we do not have that money. 
at that point, the buyer is in default of the contract and the buyer has three banking days to cure the default. Um, again, some holders require that cure be in certified funds, um, but the buyer has three banking days to cure the default. If the buyer does not cure that default, the seller may within seven days terminate the agreement. So the seller must do it in writing, terminate the agreement with notice to the buyer. If the seller doesn't terminate this agreement, then the parties are still in contract. There is just no earnest money in the deal. Now, um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about earnest money and attorneys holding it in the next section. The closing attorney and law for, firm. Buyer shall have the right to select the closing attorney to close this transaction and therefore selects. If the buyer's mortgage lender, because who does the attorney represent? If there's a loan, the closing attorney represents the mortgage lender. If the buyer's mortgage lender refuses to allow that closing attorney to close the transaction, then the buyer shall accept another closing attorney that's acceptable to the lender. The closing attorney, here it is, shall represent the mortgage lender. If the buyer is not getting um, financing, then the closing attorney represents the buyer. Now that does not mean that the, the buyer has legal representation. All that means is that the closing attorney is hereby directed to prepare all of the closing paperwork with respect to the buyer's position per this contract. That's all it means. They, they haven't paid the closing attorney to represent them and their legal interests with respect to the contract. They're not on retainer. It just means that the closing attorney is directed to prepare the closing paperwork with respect to the buyer's position. All right, I'm gonna talk about um, earnest money and uh, all uh, why this is so important. Basically, uh, the buyer is entitled to the earnest money if, if you never go under contract. So if the agent gets the earnest money and uh, you hold it and you write an offer but you never go binding, then the holder, the, the agent has turned it into the holder and the holder can then disperse the earnest money back to the buyer. Or if the, uh, 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 basically, if the contract terminates based on a contingency that is still, that is not unexpired, so a contingency that's still intact and the agreement is subject to this, then the buyer is entitled to their earnest money back. Or if you terminate uh, due to the default of the seller, the holder can disperse the earnest money back to the buyer. Or if it's uh, terminated with a specific right to terminate, that would be something else provided for. Otherwise, the earnest money goes towards the contract, towards the purchase price. Basically, the earnest money is layaway for the buyer on the house. Now, this section, let me talk about this. The holder shall disperse. So this is where the buyer, buyer is entitled to the earnest money back, but this is how it's actually dispersed. At closing, the holder can then disperse it uh, where it needs to go per the closing, or a subsequent written agreement of the buyer and the seller and that would be what we refer to as the termination and release agreement or in an order of the court or arbitrator having jurisdiction over the, the um, contract or if the parties fail to go into a binding agreement so um, where there's no dispute. In addition, so basically if a contract does not close, there is a form called a termination and release agreement. And any party can terminate a contract. You only need one signature to terminate a contract. Once it's terminated, it's terminated. Once it's terminated, the buyer can go on and buy another property and the seller can go on and put the house back up for sale and sell it to someone else. The, what's at odds, what's under issue is the disbursement of the earnest money. Who gets the earnest money back? Well, that depends on who terminated the contract and why they terminated. If a party terminates by a, an agreed upon contingency that has not expired, then the party that terminated, if they terminated under that contingency, they are entitled to that earnest money back. If a party terminated by default, then typically the other non-defaulting party is entitled to that earnest money. But the holder can only disperse the earnest money if they get set 
written agreement between the buyer and the seller. So on that TNR, there's two things. There's one thing that has, GAR has both of these concepts on one form, and it's F83. And it has the termination part at the top. It says who is terminating and which party is terminating and why. And that only requires one party signature. Then at the bottom, it has the proposed disbursement of the earnest money. And that says which party gets the earnest money and you agreement is required. You need both the buyer and the seller's written agreement to disperse for the holder to disperse the earnest money to what it says on that form. If that form is signed, you have agreement, then the holder can disperse the earnest money with no issues. If that, if what is proposed to disperse the earnest money is not agreed upon, meaning the buyer and the seller have not both signed that portion, the release portion, then the holder has, uh, has to make a decision what to do. The holder can either make a reasonable interpretation of the contract. So basically the holder goes through the contract, goes through the circumstances and the series of events and decides why did this contract fail to close? Why didn't it close? Who terminated? Did the party that terminate terminate based on a contingency that the buyer and the seller agreed to? And did they terminate within the time frame allowed for for that contingency? If the, and the holder has to do a lot of research, the holder has to find out. So for example, let's say the buyer and the seller agreed upon a 10 day due diligence uh, notice and the buyer terminates on the last day of due diligence. So that, that uh, notice to terminate is dated on the last day of due diligence. Well, it's not only the date on that form, the holder has to determine did the, in this situation, this example, if the buyer terminated on the last date of due diligence, did they send that notice of termination prior to that last day? Did the buyer send that notice of termination on day 10? Or did the buyer's agent get it signed by the buyer on day 10, but not send it to the seller on day 11? If the buyer signed it on day 10, but did not send it to the seller till day 11, guess what? The buyer has defaulted. Because not only does the buyer have to terminate within that time frame, you have to give notice prior to the end of that contingency. So those are the kinds of things that a holder has to research. Not only does a holder look at the documents, a holder also has to get in touch with the agents and look at the email communication to prove when notices were sent. Um, and if the notices and everything uh, were agreed upon by a contingency that the parties agreed upon. So the holder does all of this, makes an interpretation, writes a letter of who, which party they're going to disperse the earnest money to, and then the holder has to give the parties 10 days before they can actually disperse. Within that 10 days, if the party not getting the earnest money makes an objection, they have to do it in writing within that 10 days. If uh, the holder and the objection has to be something based on the contract that the buyer and the seller agreed upon. If the holder changes their mind, for example, let's say uh, there was another amendment uh, signed by the buyer and the seller, the holder never got a copy of it. Uh, let's say the party not getting the earnest money says, hey holder, here's an amendment you never saw. If the holder changes their mind, the holder sends a new uh, uh, letter, 10 day letter, and then the time frame starts over. If the holder does not change their mind based on any written objections, the initial 10 day time frame stays intact and the holder then disperses those, that money to that person 10 days. If the um, uh, holder offers the earnest money to the seller, then the holder, again, having made a reasonable interpretation of the contract due to the buyer's default, and sends the required 10 day notice. If the seller accepts that earnest money, then they are accepting that offer as liquidated damages in full settlement of all claims. So basically if a buyer defaults on the contract, the holder sends the earnest money to the seller. If the seller deposits that money, then it's liquidated damages, full settlement, meaning the seller cannot turn around and also sue the buyer for their default and the holder may send the seller a W-9 form. Actually, uh, that should be 1099. They, mess, they messed it up again, but that should be 1099. Um, <laughs> if a seller wants to sue a buyer, then the seller doesn't have to accept the earnest money. 
Um, they can say, no, don't send me, uh, I'm not going to deposit the check. And then the seller can sue the buyer for, uh, typically a, it's a specific performance lawsuit with damages. And um, the buyer would get their earnest money back, but they'd be sued for the, the basically the sale price of the house um, or and damages. So have to get with an attorney on that. The other option that the holder has for the earnest money, if it's in dispute, is the holder can say, this is above and beyond my level of legal knowledge. This is more complicated. There are too many legal issues involved. I am not going to make this decision. I'm going to interplead these funds into the registry of a court of competent jurisdiction. I have to hire a, an attorney to file a motion into the court so that a judge can hear the case and decide. Not, it's not a lawsuit over the contract. It's just what happens to the earnest money. If that is the case, I get to deduct my expenses to hire a lawyer from that earnest money. So if your earnest money is less than about five, ten thousand dollars $10,000, it's not worth it because depending on the county um, and the amount of the money, it can be anywhere from seven fifty dollars to 1500 or more to file an interpleader action with the court and the holder gets to deduct those funds from the earnest money. This also says uh, hold harmless. Uh, all parties agree that they hold the holder harmless against all claims and injuries or damages from performing their duty. So basically nobody can sue the holder for the decision, but license law does hold the broker holder as responsible by license law. I cannot just, any broker cannot just disperse the earnest money to their client simply because it's their client. The holder will jeopardize their own personal real estate license as well as the firm's real estate license. Um, so there's a lot of things uh, that goes into the responsibility of the holder, especially regarding the disbursement of the earnest money. A couple of issues you guys have got to keep in mind regarding this. If, let's say, a buyer terminates a contract on due diligence, completely within their time frame, let's say the parties had agreed upon a 10-day due diligence time frame, and the buyer terminates on day five, and uh, so they're completely and sends notice to the seller, they're terminating within that due diligence time frame. They have completely demonstrate that they have terminated within an unexpired contingency and given notice to the seller they're terminating. If this, even though they are completely entitled to that money back, if the seller does not sign that release agreement, because you have to have written agreement, the holder still must do this 10 day letter. So if your buyer has earnest money, you have to be careful. But basically what I'm saying is you have to be careful what you tell your buyer about them getting their earnest money back. If you say, hey, we're going to go into this contract with the due diligence period, you're completely protected. If you terminate within this time frame, you'll get your earnest money back. Well, the buyer thinks they're going to get their earnest money back immediately. However, it may not be immediately. It may take you a couple of days to determine the seller's not going to sign it. And a seller cannot sign it for a variety of reasons. Either the seller's upset or the listing agent just can't get hold of the seller. For whatever reason, if the holder doesn't get that agreement signed, the, the holder must go through this whole 10 day process. And it takes at least 10 days. Typically it could take anywhere from 12 to 17 days before the holder actually disperses those funds back to the buyer. So if your buyer goes under contract on property one, and terminates within due diligence period and wants to put a, a contract on property number two, that seller is also going to want earnest money. So this earnest money is tied up. This buyer may not use this earnest money for the second contract because it is tied up until this process occurs. So the buyer might need to come up with additional earnest money for that second contract. That's the first thing to consider. Um, the other thing to consider is um, if a buyer, remember back here where we talked about where the buyer is to remit the funds. So let's say a buyer doesn't send the funds until, let's say this is seven. Buyer is to send the holder earnest money of uh, $8,500 within seven days of binding agreement date. Let's say the buyer terminates under due diligence on day three. So the buyer hasn't even remitted those funds yet. Well, if earnest money is addressed in the creation of a contract, 
earnest money must also be addressed in the termination of a contract. So what that means is under this, we still need agreement. So what you would write as an agent in the release portion of the termination release is you would just put buyer to retain earnest money, not yet remitted per paragraph A7B. So you just reference the paragraph where the parties agreed that the buyer wasn't even to send it in yet. You reference that, that the buyer gets to keep it even though they haven't retained it. But you still must address the earnest money in the release. And then the third thing is, I have just gone over a number of issues that the holder is responsible for doing regarding the earnest money. They have to deposit it. If they never got it, they have to send notice. And then if there is earnest money in dispute, if the contract fails to close and the, the, the buyer and the seller don't agree in writing where the earnest money goes, the holder has to go through this process and the holder has to send notice or interplead it into the courts and so forth and so on. When you as an agent sign a contract, you are signing on behalf of your, your broker. You are an affiliated licensee with your broker and your broker has agreed to be uh, to fulfill the duties as holder of the earnest money by virtue of you or the agent signature on the contract if the broker is the one identified up here as the holder of the earnest money. Nowhere in this contract is there a place for the attorney to sign the contract. So if the buyer and the seller want the attorney to hold the earnest money, the attorney, by virtue of just the purchase and sale agreement, is not obligated to fulfill any of these responsibilities. The attorney doesn't sign the contract. So the attorney doesn't agree to deposit the funds, doesn't agree to send notice if they don't get it or if it bounces from the bank. And if there's a dispute over the earnest money, if the uh, uh, buyer and the seller don't sign the uh, uh, release portion, the attorney isn't obligated to do all of this that I just discussed because the attorney doesn't sign the contract. They don't have to do it. They don't agree to do it. There are some closing attorneys that will say, I don't care what happened, even if the buyer defaulted, I am giving the earnest money back to the buyer because that's the party that gave me the check. So anyway, all kinds of issues. GAR has come up with a form and this year in 2017, and it is a new form called F84, and it is called Agreement for Escrow Agent to Hold Earnest Money. I believe I have a copy of it in, in here later on. If the buyer and the seller choose to have a closing attorney hold the earnest money, absolutely do not fill this in without using this form. This form does have a place for the attorney to sign. It does say that the attorney agrees to fulfill the responsibilities of holder as outlined in the contract. Um, and the, the attorney signs that. So number one, you need to make sure the attorney is willing to fulfill the responsibilities of holder. Also, you need to make sure that the attorney is going to sign that form before you fill that out. Now, there is a place on that form also where a closing attorney or any escrow agent can charge a fee for that responsibility. So take a look at that if you are going to have the closing attorney hold the earnest money. Um, I'm going to continue on, but I'm going to stop this one recording, and we're going to have two more recordings for you to continue on with this CE class. So we're going to take a little bit of a break here. I uh, hope you're enjoying it so far. We're going to continue on with the purchase and sale agreement, with the financing contingency forms, and a couple of other documents that you're going to need. So hang on.